these women would have a ritual where they would fight to the death to find out who were the true Parthenoi or virgins. family welcome back to the channel guys come on into this dimension we have an amazing topic of discussion today regarding the cults of athena minerva medusa the vestal virgins what this stuff is all about we got all of it here today with the leading lady uh who knows all about it so be sure to subscribe go ahead and click that notifications bell hit that like button today because we are going to dive into the topic of discussion and my guest that you have here you've probably seen her on the channel a couple times now she is really quickly starting to become one of my most favorite people to connect with just because she's such an amazing wealth of knowledge and also a little bit of sass in class I have to throw that in there too because <laughs> yeah it's just awesome so she's just amazing she's an author of three divine books um bodies of literature so we're going to kind of go over some of um the things that she's written because she's currently working on a new book and i just love it so much i love your um your writing style all of it there's so much i want to give you so much feedback today but let me just go ahead and uh introduce you here this is marguerite rigoglioso and how are you doing today sister I'm doing great. I'm so excited to be here with you, Indy, because I also am such a fan of you, you, your work. <laughs> um, every time I listen to you watch one of your videos, I'm like, oh my gosh, this woman gets it. I wish you had been around, you know, 10 years ago and more when I was doing all this stuff, because it would have been really nice to have such a soul sister, but timing is what it is. And so here we are now. Yeah, definitely. And it does feel like there is um, a strong network of divine feminine really stepping up into their empowerment, really taking it to the next levels of creation here on this earth. I have just been seeing so much divine happening within that amongst the sisterhood. It's been really cool to watch. Yeah, not the least of which was your amazing trip to Rome, where I watched all your videos about that. And I was like, you really get it um at just the deeper deeper levels that i was starting to become aware of again years ago and wished that i had had more sisterly camaraderie in it uh so it was just amazing to see you doing all that grid work there and really getting what went on there what's been going on the desecration of the feminine and all the many layers and you know spiritual groups of women that have been uh demeaned and diminished and beheaded you know along with that so thank you for doing that work yeah thank you so much for just being able to acknowledge and to see me in that work and you know everything that went into it that medusa piece i have to tell you i mean it was really connected in a lot of ways to the, the ways in which you activated me just uh with the womb work and the connection that we seem to share with Medusa. So um, maybe that's kind of a good place for us to start this discussion, because I know you've also had uh, experiences with her spirit or the deity or the the just the energy, the essence of her. And how do you interpret that? And what was your experience like? Yeah, I mean, when I first started keying into the sacred feminine several decades ago, maybe three decades ago, um, I Medusa was one of the first female beings that I came in contact with, understanding that there was a much distorted story and feeling the tragedy of the beheading of her and how that was a that was a tragedy for all women and for the feminine that's 
the repercussions are still happening into today's world. Mm -hmm. And then when I started doing my research on divine birth as a real practice of holy women in ancient Greece and beyond, I dug into the ancient material on Medusa and realized she was actually a priestess. She was a historical priestess of Athena Neith. She was a virgin mother and something went down with, with her practice and with her story, like so many of those virgin birth women who got raped. And, um, you know, through that whole series um, of events, she ended up getting beheaded by Perseus. And years later, after I had done all this research and written my first book, um, The Cult of Divine Birth in Ancient Greece, I then was in a medicine ceremony with a woman who, um, Shauna Holm, who was doing a mushroom ceremony for herself in a group of um, that I had led to do a workshop on divine birth up in Mount Shasta. And she revealed something during that ceremony that showed me what my karma was with Medusa. So we can go into that or I'll just pause there and see. Yeah, no, I would love to hear this because I, I think I, I think it's all, it's all tied together. Yeah, you know, it's I all mean, tied together. Yeah, even how you were guiding me um, at the time back to Neith and yeah. the North African priestess and with the crown of snakes you know, I included some of that directly in that healing that I did in the art piece, the theatrical uh, representation of her energy that I put together, but it, which was amazing. And everybody should see that film. It's really quite beautiful and stunning. And it, it, it incorporates exactly the feelings that I had when I first learned about Medusa. So, yeah. And you and I do share some Italian ancestry and I really have half of my ancestry is Sicilian, which means that it's in large part African DNA influenced and injected, um, which is, I believe, why I have, you know, the hair that I have, which was really corkscrewy when it was when it was um, brown. And uh, I, I just think that that this hair is a living memory of Medusa in my life, you know, among other things. And so here's how my karma goes with it. You ready? Mm -hmm. Okay. So Shauna said when she was channeling essentially the Pleiades during that ceremony at night, she said, oh, um, you are, you are the reincarnation of the mother of, uh, who is that person? And we realized she was talking about Perseus. She said that I was the reincarnation of the mother of Perseus, who was Danai. Danai was the priestess who was tricked into having sex with Zeus when she was in the midst of her parthenogenetic conception ritual. He came upon her on the astral plane through the most dastardly trick of all, which was a shower of gold or a shower of golden light. That is precisely how the original divine birth priestesses conceived, was through light. So in comes Zeus, this reptilian being, Jung, hey, I'm not a reptile, I'm not a reptilian, I'm light, impregnate with me. And at the last moment, she realized, oh my God, you know, like as she was having her, you know, orgasmic um, conception orgasm, she realized this isn't Parthenogenesis, this is Zeus. And it was too late. So she was horrified and that resulted in the conception of Perseus. Perseus was the one who then went to find Medusa in order to save his mother from an unwanted marriage with a king, meaning she would have to um, release her virginity yet again. He went and found this king demanded the head of Medusa and um, that, you know, he, he would not rape uh, Perseus's mother, Danai, if he got him the head of Medusa, which was supposed to be known to be very powerful. Medusa was this super high level 
priestess that that turns out she was a priestess of divine birth herself. And um, so, you know, as I said, and so Perseus gets the head, takes it. And then what I received in my own ceremony was the king raped his mother, Denai, anyway. So it was like tragedies all around. And I think that Perseus himself wasn't necessarily a bad guy, but by beheading Medusa, the head queen of the Gorgon tribe of North Africa, where uh, Athena Neith had originated, and she was of divine birth priestess, this was a huge travesty. It had huge ramifications in the ancient world. And um, so I now understood why in this lifetime I was so horrified at the, the idea of Medusa having been decapitated because I was indirectly responsible by having essentially broken my virgin vow, though by circumstances pretty much kind of in a way out of my control, although I would have blamed myself for not having created a stronger container so that Zeus could not come into my astral space as I was doing a divine conception, right? So when she said that, I was like, oh my God, this makes total sense to me. Now I know why I am the only person in the world who created the family tree of Danai as part of my dissertation. Literally, I went to all, like you, I went to all this research and I'm like, wait, she's the mother of, she's the mother of, she, and Danai is in this lineage of divine birth priestesses that go way back. And um, I had traced, you know, all of her forebears and her progeny. And so it all kind of came to completion and I understood what the karma was and previously in a medicine ceremony before Shauna even came through with this information, I was shown that the reason I had been, uh, I had agreed to bring the awakening of divine birth back onto the planet as a real thing mm -hmm. was because I had broken my virgin vow in a previous life as a virgin birth priestess. So now with Shauna's revelations, I was able to bring the two things together. Ah, I had broken my virgin vow with Zeus by letting his astral phallus come into me and impregnate me with Perseus, who then created a great travesty on the planet, even though I loved Perseus and ultimately he was trying to protect me. But this is how these forces work. They snarl everybody in, they weave them in and it leads to one tragedy after another. Yeah. Well, that's a pretty incredible like thing to activate to and to remember and to integrate from your Akash and then to be so connected that it's tying into your mission and what you're supposed to be bringing to the world now. I mean, this seems like it's, you know, deeply rooted in your eternal contract of, you know, what you are becoming in this life. So it's pretty amazing and it's deep. And I think the recollection of all this is I think imperative to the divine feminine on a lot of levels, as I think many of us were, you know, have Akashic history in the Roman times and the Greece times, even in Africa and ancient Egypt and, and Libya, you know, why is it that we're so drawn to her? You know, we must have been a part of these cults of Neith and cults of Athena, and we were Vestal virgins at one time. Yes. I kind of wanted to bring it back to maybe just the idea of virginity. Um, and the power within vir what virginity is, because this is something that's really been activating for me within this. Like, um, I even watched the movie the other night of Elizabeth the first, 1998, C Kate Blanchett. Yes. Oh my gosh. I know. She embodied that so much, especially at the end where she is like, oh, she gets that white face and. Yeah. She's like, I have become the virgin sovereign, but in a twisted way in the British empire, you know, because mm -hmm. it all gets twisted because yeah, virginity originally, what is it? It's sovereignty. It's self-sufficiency. It's a woman who has achieved the bridal chamber or the sacred marriage within herself. So she can have the choice of either conceiving a child parthenogenetically or conceiving a child tantrically with someone else. So 
virgin could be sexually active or she could be celibate. This is what my the latest layers of what I'm discovering, which is where the Mother Mary, Mary Magdalene information comes in because because I just finished writing a section on that in my new book about Mother Mary, about how they were essentially both virgins on some level, but in the sense of the sovereign priestess. And one of them was celibate um, who became a priestess of divine conception, sacred parthenogenesis, Mother Mary, all in and of herself. The other was Magdalene who became the virgin who chose sacred marriage mm -hmm. you know, with Jesus, okay? So we're starting to learn the depths of these understandings that the whore was the holy one, not because she was holding opposites, but um, tantrika and, and virgin celibate were the same, depending on how the woman wanted to act out. Okay. Um, that's a, that's a good thing to kind of bring up because I know from reading your book, um, you talked about the contention between the different tribes of women. And this is what fascinates me is the, uh, armies of the, of the women in Africa that would, were put to fight each other. Yeah. So were they put in these wars to fight each other over the contention of the idealizations of what's pure and impure or to fight for purity or to fight for, where did where did yeah and, and is this like the origination of the contention is from this right that's a really good question because what you're referring to are the Aussie tribes A U S E the Aussie tribes of North Africa that were centered around in Libya um, ancient Lake Tritonis or the River Triton which could be contemporary Tunisia. And that's where, quote, Athena was said to be born, namely in her original version as Neith, in her African form. Um, so these women would have a ritual where they would fight to the death to find out who were the true Parthenoi or virgins. And it's really unclear, like, was this a divination right to find out who was celibate or was it a divination right to find out who was going to be the chosen priestess or priestesses to conceive divinely right but it's in some way the women got pitted against each other and in one of these stories it said that athena herself killed her best friend Pallas. And she was so horrified that this had happened because so clearly already there's a patriarchal insertion. Insertion women are, and even goddesses are starting to do things they don't really want to do. It's resulting in a tragedy. And that's why she took on the name Pallas Athena. She joined it with her name to honor her friend who she had killed in this combat. And so, yeah, women killing each other over virginity related to Athena Neith. You know, that's something to really like go into a medicine ceremony or a meditation about. Um, I don't even know. I mean, we could start trying to get the information together right now. Yeah. Well, I think there's such a psychological, underlying psychological component as how we identify it, maybe with purity, even in our current times, if our ancient Akashic past was about really having to defend and fight for that. I mean, and it still kind of is that way today. I mean, there's a lot of, of um, speculation and probing and crossing of boundaries and, you know, with people trying to find out information or to expose certain information or the pressure on the divine feminine, you know, and other types of realms and, and areas on the earth that that's happening where women are just being kind of exposed or, you know, put for, through the ring because of what their virginity status is. That's and, right. I want, and I, I want to make it clear too, that like women can kind of go back into like a virginic state, right? Yes, they can. You can restore your virginity even energetically in the womb in terms of removing any other imprints of partners 
Okay, so for women who had had sexual relating, um, they could restore their virginity. And that was encoded in the story of Hera, who would periodically restore her virginity, um, despite being yoked in marriage to Zeus even though she was before that a celestial goddess who had nothing to do with Zeus. But then this reptilian creature comes in and starts, you know, wooing her and marrying her and she's forced into it. But there were that ritual that her statue would be periodically even yearly washed to restore her virginity has its analogs in India. You know, I had um, learned from this shaman there, Nandu Menon, who wrote a book, Kali's Odia, which was all about his grandmother's and auntie's um, matriarchal practices. And one of them was to restore a woman's virginity, which they found particularly useful in the case where, where girls had been raped and they wanted to get all that energy out of them. So it wasn't like a one-time thing. You're a virgin and then you're not a virgin if you have sex. Like it had to do you with- there's some sort of like- telltale sign that you've cleansed that you've officially cleansed all past partners and you've gone back into a virginic state or how do you think it's just one woman kind of knows like i'm i'm pure now um, she knows that she's cleared right in a way it's a lot of like the work you do which is to remove tags from people and things like that um residues of partners can remain in the vagina and so forth. And it, it has shifted your like spiritual pH, if you will. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, but it can be restored um, for women who want to have sovereignty within themselves so that their womb can do certain actions and activities. Again, it's the purification of the womb chakra that Sri Kaleshwar talks about and offers a mantra technique that, that I've taught as well. So there's something about being able to come back to that sovereign state of energetic self-alignment. Um, you could call it purity if you want or not. It's not really though in the sense that it's come to think, be thought of as purity, mm -hmm. you know, um, that sex is dirty. It's just an energetic wholeness. Recently, I've been really tying purity to power. Yeah. When I was reading about the Vestal Virgins, it was saying that they had so much influence over the city that because of their purity, they could go and like take somebody who's off death row, like off death row. They could save people who were being hung or executed. And if, if a Vestal Virgin put her sights on you, that that person would then be saved. So they had so much influence That's over, right. over, yeah, morality and, and integrity. And so they're held in this like very high regard. Right. Um, and then right. even the Virgin Queen, um, there's been like psychologies of, around power. I was reading the book, um, The Power of the 48 Laws and by Robert Green, And he's talking about how um, when a woman maintains her like virginity, she maintains the status of power. So she doesn't give like her attention to anyone, like the desire of the worship. And so she keeps all of these like suitors kind of orbiting around her, but never actually allowing to like commit or allow them to get any closer. Um, because then that would be to be as slaved to them, the enslaved, right. to them, keeping like this st particular stature that embodies you know, and I would say to the divine. That's right. I would say that's even a later stage of the behavior of a virgin under patriarchy, where now she's having to play games around it. Um, whereas before, there were no manipulation games that had to have happen between her, men, and anyone. It was just woman is sovereign. She also wasn't sought after by the sort of um, rapacious phallus that was like going to rape any sovereign woman. That's patriarchy. In the, in the previous stage, it was like women were sovereign, men were sovereign, um, they were respected. Women could do a whole host of things with their sovereignty, with their womb, from parthenogenetic conception to healing at a distance and so forth. So there's been 
uh, devolvement over what virginity sovereignty has been and has meant into these times where under the Christian program, it's virginity equals purity, what they left out all the steps of energetic power, energetic sovereignty, you know, so it's just virginity equals lack of sex equals purity. Everything that's good about virginity is stripped out of that equation. Mm -hmm. And then women are controlled sexually with it. Yeah. Whereas women used to control like a, themselves. Right. But there is like this form of wisdom that comes from those intimate experiences. And how is a virgin to attain the wisdom if she's not attaining the experiences? So I almost wonder, like, could a 30 year Vestal Virgin be as wise as a woman with 30 years of, let's say, <laughs> right, bringing life into the world and experiencing mm -hmm. Not in the reptilian Roman Republic, that's for sure. Because by the time those women are there, they're basically being used and controlled. Their womb power is being used. Yes, they got a whole bunch of trainings that took like 10 years for them to be able to do what they could do energetically, which I think also involved divine conception that's very hidden, but still there in the, in the Roman record. But they were largely having their yoni power yoked to the fire of Rome. They were like literally feeding the beast machine that needed the womb power of the feminine to run itself as a reptilian enterprise. So the Vestal Virgins are like a latter day, very disempowered version of what originally a sovereign would have been in say Lemuria or you know another time frame when things were holistic on the planet yeah and I feel like I got a taste of that when I went to Rome by going to the gardens of Tivoli it was a cardinal's home and as soon as you go in I mean there are floor deleases everywhere I mean all over everything um, so it was uh, really interesting because I felt like I was in the place of where that implant maybe originally came in yeah. and was superimposed onto the bloodlines of. Yeah, that would make sense to me. I know that fleur de lis being like the replication of the womb, but in a kind of an AI format, little glyph that then they could use, right, to in control an implant and that you take out those implants. Uh, yeah. for people so yeah I mean by the time we got the Roman Empire boy there's little that I'm admiring or would want to be involved in including being a Vestal Virgin because I think those women ultimately had miserable lives they were under a lot of threat they were put in there at six years old um, and then when they came out they were a little bit um, taboo people you know, that it was it was harder for them to get married and so forth, even though they were only about 30 years old, but they were considered, you know, over the hill. Mm -hmm. So it was a it was a tough type of life. And Indy, what I get is those Roman Vestal Virgins were involved with sex with the god Mars because the foundation of the Roman Vestal Virgins is the story of Rhea Silvia, who was impregnated by the god Mars and had Romulus and Remus. And that is telling us that she was not sovereign. She was already being impregnated by Mars. Who is this god Mars? You know, like, first of all, if we think of Mars as the planet, we're talking about a reptilian colonization scheme. Mm -hmm. Yes. So there's some aspect of reptilian colonization scheme that's getting into the womb of this woman, giving birth to Romulus and Remus, the twins, who are, everyone's afraid of them, they're thrown into the river, then they start fighting, and one of them wins, you know, the more reptilian one wins, and then he founds Rome. It's a, it's a reptilian Martian um, place, onto which the church that shall remain unnamed inserted itself 
Okay. And that's, I think, a lot of what you were picking up either directly or indirectly and working with, you know, like, holy gosh, these travesties that we as women has got to speak up about and do something. Yeah. Well, it really takes me back to when I look at the story of that, you know, I start thinking, well, what other, what other accounts of the Reyes Silvia story maybe happened in ancient Egypt, or even going back even further, you know, where was the original reptilian invasion? You know, my research has taken me back to planetary warfare. It's taken me back yes. to Tiamat and Marduk, Absolutely. the asteroid belts, that this was something that seated as maybe like a mental complex in the Earth's grid fields that these stories or these archetypes or these deities are like a manifestation of like realization markers or realization points of when the inceptions incurred, but that it might be originally, at least what I've seen with the Polarian root race is just the original devastation of the 12D avatar matrix, that this was just. Yes, absolutely. And that's why they're cast as mythology because there's no real time place that you can pin this. Like what year was this? Mm -hmm. Um, was Rhea Silvia from Etruria, which was pre-Roman over there, you know, right? Whenever you know you're in the, whenever you're in the domain of mythology, you know you're in the domain of indeterminate timelines and right. histories that have gone distorted or missing that we're trying to figure out. So good for you for yeah, well, I was thinking lot. about it too in terms of this could have been the Watchers as well. I mean, yes. you have the Nephilim were fallen angels. And so, if you think about Zeus coming in as light, really coming in as a fallen angel. Yeah. I mean, it's horrible, you know, when you when you think about it. And the thing that has gone missing in all these stories is the function of the womb in it and the use, misuse and rape of the womb and the seeding because they all of these dastardly foundations no matter how AI or Atlantean or whatever they were, needed a womb. And that's encoded in Zeus's story of swallowing the pregnant Metis who was pregnant with Athena and giving birth to her through his head. He was trying to usurp parthenogenetic power, but he didn't have the right apparatus to do it. And it was said that sometimes, um, she came out of his thigh. You know what I mean? That's a phallic mm -hmm. reference. So they're playing around in the realm of women's reproductive material, be it on the goddess level, you know, in the womb or the human level. This is what always goes missing in the stories. And that's why I'm really glad for the work you're doing and the work people like Lisa Renee are doing because they point to uh, the realization of the feminine and the use of her body parts and the rape of her body parts and so forth on every level of the hologram. So that kind of brings me to the question too, is how do you perceive Athena's energy then? Because Athena, I mean, being birthed from Zeus, parthenogenically being birthed from Zeus, which just feels like an inversion in the first place. Yes. Um, Cause men weren't parthenogenically creating that this wasn't something that they did, but I was reading parts that maybe it was a possibility. They, they have to do something artificial to let it happen. So like there's Atum who ejaculates into his own mouth, um, right? They have to use some kind of orifice for this to happen. So this is talking about AI and manipulation, all right, to create artificial womb structures or whatever that are not authentic and organic. So um, the, the issue with Athena is that in the timeline in which Zeus swallows Metis, who is originally um, the mother of Athena, the parthenogenetic mother of Athena, who's an aspect of Neith, the great original parthenogenetic goddess, um, it's inverted. She goes through the mesh of Zeus. So it creates a false feminine grid and Athena comes out with that. She's a distorted version of Neith Athena. Okay. And so 
we I've done rituals where I've had women take the grid, uh, the mesh off of Athena to restore her to her original parthenogenetic great creatrix energy as Neith, the primordial goddess of Africa, of Egypt. So yeah, I mean, we're talking about distortions, manipulations, timelines, um, hijacking of the feminine and twisting her into something else to the point where in the ancient plays, uh, Athena was said, you know, motherhood is inconsequential and I am all for the father and the male. Yeah, that was that's really interesting how Athena kind of sits at the head of the patriarchy. I I seen something that is said Athena was like above Poseidon. She was above yeah. these other gods. Absolutely. She was originally the primordial goddess of Egypt who was brought up to um Athens or what became Athens by Kekrops who was a half serpent being. Whether that's dragon or reptilian, we're not entirely sure because under his reign, women lost all their matriarchal power. So it doesn't sound too positive. He, there was a foundation of Athena in Athens, but already she's the distorted neath. Okay, so this is what we have to look at. And it's like, you understand this, you know, and it has real ramifications in our lives. This is not just stories like, oh, isn't that interesting, whatever. It's like, wow, we've got to unwind this stuff. Oh, and I yes, totally agree. Yeah. He became the apex of the militarized Greek culture. And that that was just a huge um, scourge on the planet. You kind of feel like there's just like a contention egregore just around Athena's energy itself. I I wanted to kind of maybe point out, and I pulled this picture up because I think it's interesting that she holds Nike in her hand. Yeah. She puts the serpent behind her shield. So she's like hiding that. Um, but also this shield, I found out was a Medusa shield. So on the front of the shield is actually Medusa's head. That's right. And That's right. Because Medusa is a thing. Medusa is the part of Athena, is the part of Neith that got split off and created and was, was named demonic and dark and all that. Okay. But she was really the power of Neith Athena. Okay. And yeah, you're right. Athena would even, would always have her either on her ages, uh, you know, her, her breastplate or her shield showing that the two ultimately could not be divided, even though in the mythology, the storyline is that Athena is the one who arranged for Medusa's death mm -hmm. because she was angry that Medusa had sex in with, with um, a Poseidon in Athena's temple instead of having a divine birth conception parthenogenetically. You see how these stories go? They just get so... When you know how to read it from the perspective of divine birth priestessing, you can see what happens when the women start getting co-opted to have sex with gods or they get raped by gods. And then they will incur the, the anger of, you know, the original female being like, why is this happening? But the story starts getting turned into, oh, it was Medusa's fault and Athena's mad. It's female on female violence again mm -hmm. yes yes um that's something that I would like to dive into maybe some other time like a deeper topic on that you know the sources of the contention the 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 um differences between cults and prom promiscuous I don't know if you can say like a purity cult or a promiscuous cult like if they were even able to formulate in sort of a cult or maybe some of the um contention around monogamy and polygamy as well that there's kind of like this um you know right. right because you know when i used to do when i did my first workshops on divine birth i noticed this was up in mount shasta i noticed there was a group that were more like the virgins the celibate energies mm -hmm. and there was the group that was more like the tantrikas what i call them okay mm -hmm. 
I had to bring it into the room and say, let's look at it and let's um, release this energy right now because there's a way in which our groups are pitted against each other and there's like jealousy programs going on and all that kind of thing. When really, like I said, tantrika and celibacy are extensions of the same continuum, ultimately. It's just how the woman chooses to use her sovereign energy. The virgins got distorted into sexlessness. The tantrikas got distorted into common prostitution that is low vibrational, okay? All of that under patriarchy. And yes, there's a way in which a monogamy versus polyamory picture goes along in there. And like, what do we do around all that? You know, for some women, polyamory is a very upsetting picture. Mm -hmm. And for some women, um, monogamy is a very upsetting picture. And so it's like, I mean, honestly, I asked Mary Magdalene about this the other day in meditation because Claire Hart song channels that Jesus had more than one sexual partner. It wasn't just her. And so did Sri Kaleshwar, the late Hindu saint. And it's like, wow, some people are having a lot of trouble with that one. Um, and what what I what I got from Mary Magdalene was don't worry about this right now. She said, what you want to focus on is creating back the sacred marriage bridal chamber within yourself, reunifying yourself. Then you will be able to look at these things and these choices in a different way. If does that make sense to you? Like reunify, focus on the reunification within yourself. And then you can take it another step. Because everybody's worried about patriarchy in this argument. The polyamorous women are worried about the controls of patriarchy as monogamy. The monogamous women are worried about the, the fact that polyamory really ultimately is all about men just getting doing whatever the hell they want. Okay, so both of them need to be evolved up if any of them are going to work, right? Definitely. And I can see that it's such, um, I can see all of the sides because I have friends and I know women that I worked with that are coming from all perspectives. And so, yeah, it's kind of like the fabric of their belief structures um, and where they sit within it is. So this is something you're going to teach. Then you have a course coming up that you're doing that um, looks very exciting. And yeah. Oh, thanks for showing it. Yeah, the seven mysteries of Magdalene. I think that um, this issue is going to tangentially come up, but what we're going to be focusing on is the mystery of the bridal chamber and the mystery of the sacred marriage as both inner and outer processes, right? Yeah. Okay, so if someone's connecting to Mary Magdalene's energy. Um, what they're going to learn in this is kind of the inner structure of the union. And yeah. um, what about the seven sins of Magdalene? Are you going over this at all in this course? No. Um, Cause I know you've talked about it before. I, I've Oh, the seven sins of Magdalene. Yeah. Well, what I've referred to are the seven demons that she was released of. Okay. That's in the new Testament. And that would be a really interesting question because clearly that's talking about a place where Magdalene needed to release from something from her own being in order to uh, move on with her spiritual growth. Right. And I think it was, you know, um, a demon at each chakra. And yeah, we could say, what is the biggest sin associated with each of those chakras? Right. It could be hubris. It could be, um, right. There's many different things. And so that would be, I, those are the types of things where it's like, I'm providing basic structures and concepts for then people to go off ultimately and have their own inquiry with Magdalene and their own Q and A and their own receiving of their 
of their knowledge, you know, mm -hmm. um, because this is an endless fractal that people can continue to receive information on according to what they need. So that's what the course is ultimately sets them up is to look at these seven mysteries as I find in the texts about Magdalene. And then we will spin off to a certain degree on each of them. And then I invite everyone to keep spinning off on their own afterward. Well, it looks like it's going to be a really awesome course. You're doing uh, five live online classes. Yes. Yes. And everybody can watch and replay too. If you can't make it live, even if they're listening to this after the course is concluded, it's going to remain available um, for registration indefinitely into the future. So it, it will be there. And if, if anybody here has taken the womb healing course three that we did, I mean, that was such an amazing turnout. Um, I got so much good feedback about that. And I feel like we just were able to really introduce a lot of new concepts yeah. and um, so much came through. I mean, it was such a powerful weekend and it's just so crazy how it aligned with the queen passing. No, um, among other things. Yeah, really incredible, right? Um, yeah, thank you so much for mentioning this and, and for letting everybody know. Um, I'm always referring people to you for clearings and um, your work, your YouTubes and your classes um, because of the depth of what you're bringing through that to me is just truly breathtaking. Well, I definitely feel the same way about you as there, your books are up here for. Um, yeah, they're yeah. under store. Okay. Store and then you say books. Yeah. So there's the mystery tradition of miraculous conception, which is the most recent one that makes, you know, divine birth understandable. And it connects it to the story of how it manifested through mother Mary. And then the other two, the cult of divine birth in ancient Greece and virgin mother goddesses of antiquity are really the deep scholarly dives into these two topics. And they provide like all the references and foundation in antiquity for everything that I then am able to decode in the mystery tradition of miraculous conception about Mother Mary's story. So that gave me the rocket fuel, so to speak, um, to understand what was going on for Mary. Yeah. And I really recommend guys to go and if you can get some of her books, like this one, The Cult of the Divine Birth in Ancient Greece. I've been on this one for a little while. And I'm kind of finding that it's so rich with information in each chapter that it's almost like the book's going to last me a while because I can only kind of like bring in all of the information from one chapter because it's mirroring a journey and my own like feminine templating. It's mirroring the processes and the archetypes I'm connecting to and I keep coming back to it because it's there's more pieces and more layers and I can see how it's something that you'll just continue to come back to. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. You know what it is? It's like the Tootsie Pop that you just cannot eat in one bite. Yeah. <laughs> it's it goes on and on and when I wrote it, I was told that I was being given lots of codes and transmissions in the writing that people were gonna do exactly like exactly what you're saying, um, be able to get what they need or digest at, at a certain pace um, because of what's in there. And when I go back, honestly, Indy, I go back and I look and I read, I'm like, what the heck? You know, <laughs> what kind of a state was I in? I was just in this exalted state for like the nine months that I wrote this thing. Honestly, I couldn't even function socially. I would be even at a gathering and I'd be like writing the book continually, like wherever I went, I was writing the book because that's the level of dedication, as you know, that you need to have when you're pulling through this information and working with it. Yeah, definitely. It's really amazing. Like, it's really good. I mean, I have to tell you, you did such a fabulous job. I mean, I can tell the research that you've done. You know, you have all the references there as you read through it to Timius and Plato. And I mean, you've just dived into some extensive stuff too. 
yeah. hold these records. And so it's really, it's great. Oh, it was funny because I literally used to have cartloads of books coming back and forth from my library at the California Institute of Integral Studies. They would get me this stuff through interlibrary loan. I'd have a whole shelf that I, you know, they'd have waiting for me. I'd bring them back the cart of the other books and I'd take the new ones. And I would just by night, I would read and do post-it notes. And by day, I'd be doing the writing. It was really intense. Yeah. So if you guys haven't checked out Marguerite, I really recommend maybe also subscribing to her channel. Um, hit the subscribe button, the notifications bell, all that good stuff. You can also go to my channel and you can look at some of the videos we've done in the past um, already. Did I just skip one? No. Uh, oh, did yeah. This one on the day, Dannon with Zoe on Mary Magdalene Laundry Facilities. That was a really good show. Right. And then we did another one. Um, I'm not even remembering. There we go to the right. Oh, the dra Fae Dragons and She. We were talking about some of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the collaborations with Z Earth Star as well. Yeah. Uh, we got into the reptilian force breeding programs, which ultimately the, these cults, Vestal Virgins, I mean, this is extensions of these force breeder programs. But you know what I'm finding kind of interesting and I just wanted to kind of throw this in here too is I've been really connecting with Athena's energy on a positive level and I'm not yeah. sure where that's like coming in if there's these great distortions over her because I've been seeing this level of like qualities of like diplomacy and right. just unrelenting strength and like power and and peacemaking ultimately the Greeks saw her as not liking warfare she was she was more into the peacemaking so that's what you're picking up on you're picking up on the pure stream the pure substratum of her as neath as great primordial autogenetic self-birthing goddess mm. yeah. right yeah. in her african uh personality because <laughs> we have karma there and we have literal ancestry from our lives in this life and I'm kind of seeing it too, that there was something in the Medusa piece that I was to confront like Medusa's energy first and kind of live an experience through the healing of her energy before I could even maybe understand Athena's aspect, because would you, would you say that in terms of hierarchy of the priestesshood or hierarchy of the godship that Medusa's energy would have been considered beneath Athena technically, or at least according to the gods or according to because how she had this power to turn Medusa into. She originally monster. was Medusa. She originally was. Okay. That was a, the other half of her. That's the point. They split it the way they split the feminine and we're in duality. It's always going to be virgin whore, good goddess, bad goddess, black Madonna, white Madonna, you know? Um, so, but originally- right originally yeah, like that. yeah she was a critical part of 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 athena neath part of her very soul you know this is they were one and it's only the patriarchy timelines that started separating them out and then demonizing one and controlling the other so medusa is you she is me the medicine that she has within her, the power that she has of wisdom, that's what Medusa was. She was the power of wisdom, the wind beneath Athena's wings. She is originally not a warrior goddess. She's a wisdom goddess. That is what's connecting her with Sophia, who is the womb of all creation. The original great goddess. That completely makes sense because I keep seeing the Medusa shield and relic in my energy field too. And I'm like, why is it that I feel like I'm being granted like these armors? Mm -hmm. you know, because like, now in patriarchy, we need it as armor. But eventually when all of these things become integrated and we transmute these energies, it's just going to be um, sustenance within us rather than a shield. But by, by, by connecting Medusa's head back to her body, that's how 
a symbol of this integration? I have one last question for you. It's a controversial question. So if you don't want to answer this or you want me to cut it out of the video, please just let me know. But what would you say to, and I've gone, I've poked at the, I've poked the beehive <laughs> with this question before. Um, what would you say to like the naysayers of this information, the naysayers that don't even think that parthenogenesis is cre creation is real, that this goes against cosmic law, and maybe even some that would allude to that this knowledge is a form of female Illuminati. Um, and I only ask this because I personally feel that that exists solely to try to continue to take our creation, her story away from us. That's right. I think we should not too quickly jump to the idea that it's female Illuminati. That's already a clue right there that, hey, wait, we just revealed something. Oop, now it's female Illuminati. No, mm -hmm. let's stay with the medicine a little bit and let's see what it has to tell us. And let's um, look at it because as I've talked about, yeah, divine birth has been hijacked and used and women became complicit in it during the trajectory of divine birth they started creating all sorts of things they shouldn't have in on into historical kingly lines so um in terms of just the larger belief about parthenogenesis you know what i was shown when i started doing this work in medicine ceremony was well are you bringing this information forth to unite or to divide and I said, well, to unite. And they said, well, okay. So then what you wanna be sure that you convey is that the timeline of parthenogenesis is only for those for whom it is medicine. It's not medicine for everyone. And if it's not your medicine, take your medicine elsewhere. But if you get intrigued by this concept and something in you goes, I knew it, you know, <laughs> that feels like truth to me then go down, go into this path, investigate, start getting your own information and see where it leads. Because, you know, who knows, ultimately 10, 20, 30, 100, 1,000 years from now, maybe there's like a whole other layer to the whole thing that we didn't see because yeah. we couldn't, because we had to just go through this step. And, you know, so we hold this with a certain level of like humility, but, um, you you know being fed by it for what positive it can offer us in our world i also feel there's a level of it being triggered triggering to the wounded masculine because there's some level of feeling inferior in terms of creation rights or that's right and the other piece of what i was given was are you here to divide men and women or unite them and it was like unite them and they're like okay just be clear that when you're teaching this, you're not saying that this is something to eclipse males, the phallus, or sacred marriage sexuality, you know, or, you know, just the regular sexuality that we have. And it's like, no, it isn't. This, we were talking about a specialized priestess function that originally may have, as we were talking about in Healing the Womb 3, been an original way of human reproduction, where there were really no formal male female it was like sort of more yin more yin directed women people and then more yang directed people but ultimately there was more of an integration and so the birthing was ultimately parthenogenetic that as a as the original human form and so we have to look at that time period where the sexes might have been split that plato talks about and that i talked about in healing the womb three. And so, wow, who did that? Why, you know, and what are we trying to bring back together? Yeah, I definitely think that would be a good topic to dive into because I cannot even find a lot of literature or anything around the subject of this division um, where men and women both equally here at the same time, you know, where where and how I, I have seriously haven't came across much maybe some stuff from Edgar Casey briefly right. from the Lemurian time yeah exactly because sometimes you have like this idea of 
planets of women or colonizations of women or isle, islands of women. You'll get a lot of that Isla de las Mujeres right all over the place. You go to some country and you're like, wow, I didn't realize you had an island of the women. What is that? You know, and then you look at the Amazons who were the priestesses of Athena, Neith, and also Artemis up in the, uh, you know, Turkey region. Um, what was that all about? They were like, really strong female 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 and then they took on the warrior aspect the amazons because they're like well the men aren't saving us from this reptilian incursion so we got to take it into our own hands um so there is something about yeah what are those various timelines of men fem women males females um and was the whole reptilian incursion into the earth fully a male thing from them that's what i get yes yes i've got, I actually got those messages last night and the night before oh interesting yeah. because in their planets the queens rule the roost okay and they have the vagina dentata which can take off that very nice phallus all right during sex and so that's the origin of that unconscious thing that was a freudian the vagina dentata, the castrating female womb, right? That's a memory from Orion, <laughs> the negative part of the Orion constellation. Yes. Is, is what, what I've gotten. Yeah, that's definitely a, a deep dive. I started laughing there because I actually found little candies in Rome that looked like a vagina dentata. <laughs> they were like little gummies. We were playing with them. It was just ridiculous oh my god yeah. I know that's why when I saw your like Orion you know oil I was like can I put that on you know Orion but then I realized well we're in duality there's positive Orion negative Orion maybe this could be a healing element for me and all people who are aware of um, that aspect of Orion's history yeah, maybe if you can for a second, go, I want you to go through them. So just so everybody knows, I did send Marguerite um, all six of my starseed activators for her oh, to try. Um, the best things love, ever. <laughs> yeah, I would love your uh, just introspection on them. What do you think of the smells? Do you feel the attunement to the star system as you kind of take it in? Which one do you um, like the most? So of course, the ones that I ended up with the most were Pleiadian, Lyran, and Andromedan. I don't know too much about Lyra, but I was drawn to that. And then a little bit, um, the Arcturian. So um, I think those Pleiades, Andromeda, and then Lyra are probably my, you know, my more of my origin as a soul. It are is from those places and that's probably why I tuned in it kind of didn't really surprise me um but really any of them are just so amazing and I what I do is I put one on every day I used to have an a, um, a diffuser in here but now I don't even need to have a diffuser because these things stay on all day you know I'm like wow when did that ever happen with uh, an essential oil and um what I do is I just put it on and I just have a feeling that it's it's tuning me to that vibration without me having to do the usual cognitive oracle thing that I usually do. It's just like, oh, give me a rest, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> let me just smell this and let Indy's done the work. I'm just going to go right on her vibration. That's kind of how I've been using them right now. And we will be working with these in the Magdalene course because one of the mysteries is that Magdalene is an anointing priest as she was a myrrh-bearing woman is what we find in the ancient texts. Myrrh, you know, that means she was connected with the scents and the oils. And so I'm going to be directing people, you know, to these to see, to attune, which one or ones are they most interested in and um, we'll be affiliating with you on that to, to get them to stimulate that scent passageway as the, as the doorway to the other realm, as well as going beyond Magdalene and Mary, what star system 
do you feel your facet of the crystal with them is? Because they're kind of in all the star systems, right? They're holographic. They don't belong to just Sirius or the Pleiades or Lyra. They're kind of in all of them. So each star system has its medicine and therefore each, you know, its teachings and stuff for you. And therefore each um, scent will be the same thing. So I see this as a very beautiful adjunct to uh, our work together with the Magdalene course. Yeah. And I could see the Palladian one being probably the most active Mary Magdalene because the rose oil. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. yeah. So I was, I know I use that a lot. It's like, it's going down the quickest. <laughs> and, then the, and then the myrrh. Um, yeah. When, Laura, right. Yeah. Frankincense myrrh. And then I put sea salt in it because I wanted it to have like a clearing. Yeah. As well. Yeah, I love that one too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So thank you for doing that because it's, I just think it's a brilliant thing. It's like taking essential oils to its cosmic level. level. Yeah. And that Which is really, really, I think what it is because there's so much activation of the heart chakra, of the memory, of the knowing of the higher chakras, the third eye, the opening of the crown. I can feel it all happening when I take in essential oil activation. And this is the connection with the fairies or the she who are the angelic architects of the natural world here. So plants and plant elixirs and plant fragrances and things are all part of their world. So it's like it unites it all together, right? Yes. Nothing is really separated. It's all nested holo holography within each other. And you can access through the wormhole of the Andromedan um, oil a connection out there and, and just finding out what is there for you. I've been also pulling them into grid work as well. Let's like see. if you're at a site and you want to activate that system, you know, bring the oils in, you can spray them, you know, That's whatever. Right. But I think it can activate the galactic consciousness in that field and in that Stargate and bring in and attune it more into the, the center energy of the vortex. Very much so. Such good work. Good job, Indy. Oh my God, you know, I mean, wow. Um, I just can't wait to see what you're doing next because. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be honest with you, I think I'm going to keep developing them out. I have gotten an immense amount of request for a Draco star seed spray and also a Hydra. The Draco one's very interesting to me. Um, I've gotten suggestions for Jasmine, Musk, Dragon's Oil or Dragon's Blood. Um, I know. So I'm like, hmm, <laughs> Musk, that would be very interesting. Very yeah. interesting. Maybe you're bringing in a lot of healing for those of us who have had issues mm -hmm. around all that in particular. Um, okay. Worth meditating on, right? The biggest message I got when I made these and did this was that starseed consciousness will become mainstream like it's just a matter of time it will be something that people refer to just like they do astrology or, or like they're just like i'm a scorpio i'm a cancer but soon starseed consciousness will be global worldwide and it will be a part of our acceleration into the new earth that that information does have to come in for all indigos and all empaths and those that are you know mm -hmm. recollecting the christos consciousness and so there has to be tools there has to be development in getting that message out. And the activation is key for people to get that. Yeah. And what better, yummier way <laughs> of doing it through a beautiful smelling fragrance oil that's plant-based? Yes. You know, that's part of the new earth co-creation. This is it right here. Yeah. It's yeah. so awesome. Yeah. Thank you for doing it. Thank you for sharing and for just trying them out and, um, you know, sharing them with your, uh, everyone who's joining your course. I hope that everyone watching today to just go check it out on her website, see if it's something that interests you, because I really do feel like you're an incredible teacher and it's definitely worth it. And um, so thank you so much for coming on and having this discussion with me. I really appreciate your time. And um, yeah, I hope to see you again soon. Oh, yeah. And uh, thank you everyone for watching. Have a beautiful rest of your day.